Yeah. Please. I'll introduce myself and you should introduce yourself. <laughs> okay. Thank Let's you. do but that. Not each other. <laughs> each other. Hi, this is Mariko. <laughs> okay, you start. No, go ahead. You're the everyone's here to see you. Well, my name is Mariko Tamaki. I am the co-creator of the most banned book in America for 2016, uh, which is this one summer. I write comic books for a living now, which is super weird. Um, I currently write uh, for Supergirl for DC Comics and Hulk for Marvel. If you're here to ask me about either of those two books, they're both already written, so there's very little I can do to change the plots at this point. Um, and yes, I am... I'm a writer, and I live in Oakland. Uh, I'm Casey. I'm also a comics writer. None of my work is banned or actually even published yet. It's pending. Um, and a comics editor. I was a comics journalist for six years, and Mariko and I are good friends. Yes. Which is why I'm here um, to moderate the conversation, which is apparently in honor of Children's Book Week, which is interesting because none of your work is exactly a children's book. No. But more young adult and... Young adult end up. Yeah, I like teenagers. I think teenagers are, I mean, are there any teenagers here? You're very interesting to me. Uh, I think teenage lives are a really interesting point for talking about things I want to talk about, like identity and sexuality, um, class, uh, all of the stuff. I think it's a very, um, you know, it's a time when you're sort of trying to decide who you're going to be when you're a teenager as opposed to when you're an adult when you're supposed to have already figured that out. Um, and I think that it's also nice because you have the setting of a high school where you have these people who are kind of all kind of forced to be together in a tiny community, which is fun to write about. And yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a point where I will probably not write about teenagers anymore. Like, I think this last couple of years, I've started to feel like like I'm looking at teenagers like, I don't get you guys. <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. Um, and I feel like I'm ready to start writing about like 20 year olds, I'm gonna move up. Was there a particular moment where you realized I don't get you guys anymore? And was it Snapchat? No, you know what it is? I think that it's something about, I mean, I think that I have a really strong connection to what it was, what being a teenager was like for me, and I don't ever try to write beyond that. But I think that it is hard. Like, I don't tend to write about Facebook or Twitter or any kind of social media whenever I write about teenagers because it's just an impossibly boring thing to write about. Yeah. Like, the drama of seeing somebody post about you um, on, like, Facebook or, like, say that they hate you on Facebook, it's like every time, like, no movie has ever done a great job of showing a social media stream. Like, movies don't even really know how to do texting very well. Maybe Sherlock is the only television series. And this is not my idea. Somebody else did a video about this. Um, so I, I just find it really hard to make interesting. So I don't tend to use it. But I think that at some point, there's maybe something I'm missing out on in terms of like talking about teenagers. And it's not even necessarily that teenagers are the people reading your books. I don't know the demographics for Supergirl, but I see mostly adults reading. Is anybody here reading Supergirl? Okay, let me tell you you're missing out. how much you're missing out. <laughs> um, traditionally, Supergirl has not been, even though it should be, the most approachable story for either teenagers or for girls. Um, not that girls read a specific kind of fiction over boys, uh, but there, there are a lot of different experiences that a teenage girl has that when they don't make it into a story, I think really leaves out a huge aspect of what it means for that character to make a sacrifice or to choose to be heroic. Um, and in Mariko's Supergirl, it's set up right away that this character is very torn between friends, family, sports, what she likes to do, and also this sort of legacy of power she's inherited which honestly isn't that interesting of a story for an ad to be told for an adult, right? Right. Because a teenager has more at stake. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that there's something, I think when you write the story, like, it's like Downton Abbey, right? Like, or for those of you, <laughs> the L word, right? Like, it's like melodrama. And I think that, you know, when you're writing about teenagers, it's, it's easier for things to be that sort of like big emotional stuff because when you're a teenager, you know, like, not having like having a bad day at school, it does feel like the end of the world because you've only been in this world for like 15 years, bless you. So it's tricky. Um, and I was actually really excited to write Supergirl because I was, it was like, I was like, there's a couple 
teen things like I've always wanted to do a giant alien zit, so I got to do that. So there was like a couple key things that I thought this is why I should do this book because it would be fun to do. Like I thought like what if you're a teenager and you can fly, but you can't tell anybody about that. Like that just sort of seemed like an interesting thing to talk about. And the the zit, although really gross and beautifully drawn by Joelle Jones, as everything in the series is, um, there were a lot of people who had a problem with it because yeah. Supergirl is supposed to be like this perfect, cute, white, blonde girl. Right. And but when you think about it, if she was an alien, she would probably have even grosser teenage puberty than yeah. a human would. There were way grosser things I could have done. Yes. You know what I mean? Like Everybody got off easy if they were super worried about an alien zit. I will say that the funnest part of it was that when we were doing the color, we were sort of like, what color should it be? <laughs> and I was like, I want it to be like a like an like an ivory. <laughs> and they were like, all right, let's just not talk about it. Let's just do it. Like me describing it was much worse than actually seeing it on the page. <laughs> but I think that there is like a, you know, I think that that's sort of true of YA too. Like people say like that they don't want, you know, that they're like one of the criticisms of YA books a lot of the time is like, I didn't like the character. And I kind of feel like, did you like everybody you met when you were a teenager? Most of the people I knew when they were teenagers were jerks. Yeah. So that's, you know, I'm super into exploring like, one of my least favorite things to watch in a movie, but my most favorite thing to write is people being mean. Teenagers being mean, especially. And it's... I know that not every, nobody here is, is reading the book, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but I do think it's a really good introduction to talk about your approach to writing teenagers, being a fan of YA, and having YA stories, um, which is that something that can often happen in YA is glossing over a lot of the things that make people interesting in lieu of making them perfect. Yeah. So sup a superhero having a zit is pretty revolutionary, which is sad in a comic book. <laughs> it no. shouldn't be. It's weird to, to have broken new ground. I'm the first c Canadian to be the most banned person in America. And, well, my cousin and I are the first Canadians. And I made the first alien zit for DC Comics. That's what's going on my resume, right? Like, that's what makes me. That's your legacy. Right. Like, Margaret Atwood both The Handmaid's Tale and I. <laughs> I and you drew a three pages at pop. I made and a, yeah. a banned book. Exactly. That is banned. Has anybody read this one summer? There you go. Do you guys know what it's banned for? Oh my gosh, you should talk about that because it's ridiculous. It's banned for obscenity. It's banned for mature themes. I think it's banned for LGBTQ content. I mean, the thing is, that the biggest tell for me is that it's banned for LGBTQ content, and there's literally two mentions of the word lesbian where one of the characters talks about the fact that she went to this thing that I made up called Gaia Camp, which is like this circle of what it right, turns like out to be. Everybody just laughed because you get it, right? Like it's... Well, actually, Gaia Camp is based off of like an actual thing, which is I think the Michigan Women's Festival had like a circle that they would sort of send their kids to, which was called like Gaia Circle or something like that. And when I heard about that, I was like, I'm going to use that and make it a thing, <laughs> basically. So um, for those of you who don't know, when a book is banned, it's not like we're pulling it out of schools, we're necessarily pulling it out of libraries. Uh, what it really means is that it's been challenged so many times that it's at risk. Um, because truly, like a banned book is a very difficult thing to execute in America. Um, but a book can be challenged so much that different institutions will refuse to use it in curriculum or refuse um, to allow it as part of education. And particularly when a, a comic book is one thing that's targeted, you can have a book like Hunger Games, right? Which is generally for the same age group. Right. Where it's literally teenagers murdering each other. Right. But then you have a drawing to go along with something way more benign. It's, it's difficult to get people to interpret a story that's told both graphically um, and with writing versus just text. Somehow, it just short circuits people's brains. And the fact that it won a children's book award when it wasn't necessarily a children's book. Right. Set it up in a weird context. Yeah, I mean, I feel like people were sort of hinting, like it was really fun being at all the Caldecott and ALA events, but there were definitely people who were like, congratulations, and there were people who were like, this book is gonna have a lot of problems. <laughs> it was like, that's really daunting to hear at a celebratory event. So we knew that it was coming. Um, but like, I mean, actually the first thing that I thought of when the book 
when we found out that we were the most banned, was I was like, The Hunger Games is literally a book where children are forced into a situation where they have to murder each other. And everybody's like, well, that's life, you know? What are you going to do? And I have, like, two kids talking about going to a camp where there's lesbian kids of lesbian parents, and they're like, that's not acceptable. We can't have our kids reading that. So I do think also, like, one thing I'm aware of is that you know, like with conflict comes change, right? So um, Deborah Cameron, who's my favorite linguist of all time, because I'm a lesbian, so I have my favorite linguist of all time. So she talks about that the time that there's the most conflict around language, especially, is when you have a change in the power dynamic. So this whole idea, for example, of like Mars and Venus and men not being able to understand what the way women talk, like when men were suddenly like, I don't understand what she wants. She's so hard to communicate with. That that notion comes with a change in the power structure where you have women in, you know, in the office and women in positions of power up, you know, with men. And I think that this whole idea of like that this content is inappropriate is also affected by the fact that there's more of it. It's not just one person writing like, you know, one lesbian book for kids. It's like there's more of it out there. And so, you know, the top five books on the top ten challenge list were challenged for LGBTQ content. So And one thing that's interesting is in Supergirl, you I think in the first issue, or maybe the second, you actually use the word dyke. I do. Which is a much more extreme word than lesbians, right. which is what's used in this one summer. Right. I don't think anybody said anything about Supergirl. Well, we did actually. We had a conversation about it because my editors, who are two lovely straight men, were like, oh, can you say dyke? And I was like, of course you can say dyke. Well, of I, course you can say dyke. I can say yes. what I can say it. I was like, it's me saying it, so it's OK. Um, but. Uh, and then actually when I was interviewed for a publication that shall remain nameless, I called the character a lesbian, uh, Dyke in the interview. And when it was came out in print, it said lesbian square brackets. Like they redacted, <laughs> she redacted my word and put like, she means lesbian. But I was like, that's not what I said. <laughs> what? People were gonna think I said lesbian. I would never say that. So I think that it is, it's like this, you know, but I think that also the, the intention of the, writer in that case was to say like, oh, we don't want to use this offensive word. And I think that it is, you know, it's like hostile territory obviously to step into, but um, yeah. I think in that, in that case too, like it's, you know, the whole idea that something is inappropriate for a younger reader assumes that the younger reader is one thing, which I think is, mm -hmm. you know, is not true, right? Like I, was a young queer person. I read really inappropriate books. I read my my mom gave me this book called like Scavengers, which had was about rich people who were cast away on this island that had a lesbian scene in it. And that was the first lesbian book I read as a teenager. Was this really inappropriate like pulp novel that my mom gave me? And you know, I turned out okay, but it would have been nice to have something that was about people my age. And actually, the book I'm working on now. Uh, with Rosemary Valero O'Connell, who's like a new coming up artist, uh, is called Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me, and it's actually about like lesbian teenagers. And we specifically made the choice to have it be less a book about kind of finding your identity than a book that just uh, just makes them queer from the get-go, and then they just like play out their drama like everybody else. What do you feel like some of the risks are to not having topics like queerness and gender identity um, and and just identity in general not addressed for young people well I think I think the thing is is that the it's always there as a subject it's just that one particular story is there about it right like there's like a story that's like girls love boys right like the story of girls love boys is in so many books and like boys are hard to deal with girls love boys and that is hard is like a story that's told forever versus the idea that, you know, that there's all different kinds of gender roles and there's all different kinds of loving people and all of these things. Like my friend Corey Silverberg, who's an amazing writer, has been doing this series of book with a uh, Toronto artist named Fiona Smith, um, where he did like, he did one book about how to make a baby and then he did another book that's about puberty. And it's like, you know, it's a book about puberty for all the different kinds of people who experience puberty, right? Like to experience pu puberty as someone who's differently able, to experience puberty as someone who's, you know, in various, you know, financial situations, like all of these things. 
And I think the more realities that are out there presented as opposed to just like girls like boys, you know, is important. And stories are such a huge way to learn empathy. Um, it's not just that people want to see themselves or their own identities totally. represented. But I think that there's a lot of assumptions that a straight eight-year-old boy wouldn't want to read a book about a queer girl or vice versa, um, that it reinforces this kind of narcissism about our entertainment, that we only want to see stories about us that look like us, that are for us. Sure. And when we miss that, we really miss the opportunity to learn empathy at a pretty important age. Yeah, I mean, I was just at RuPaul's Drag Con last weekend, and I would say, like, there were 40,000 people over the two days of the con, and I would say, like, 60% of them were teenage girls. So I was like, this is amazing. If you're a teenage girl and your introduction to femininity is drag queens, this idea that it is something that you can put on in a theater as opposed to something that you have to do, I was like, that's amazing. Like, I saw teenage girls in lace front wigs. I was like, what a world we live in today <laughs> where you have girls who are like doing like cheek contours and stuff like that. But to know that it's, that it is something that is, that is, can be fabulous. And I didn't discover, like I really didn't discover femininity until I was like 20 because I hated makeup because I just thought brown eyeshadow, I didn't, I never understood brown eyeshadow. I was like, why do I put like a maroon color on my face? Like I don't like the color maroon. Why would I ever put it over my eyes? And then when I turned 20 and MAC came out with like peacock blue and all these crazy drag queen colors because they're a very queer company, I was like, oh, I get this. Like this is amazing. Like why wasn't it always like this? And I became, yeah, like I was fully dragged out for like most of my 20s. Now I've like, I'm a little more subtle now, <laughs> as you can see. But it was, you know, it was a really great thing to discover that later when it didn't feel like uh, essential. It just felt like something that, you know, you could enjoy as an artist, as opposed to like, if you don't do this, you're not being a girl. Mm -hmm. So, and then you lose, you know? Um, are, is anybody here a Drag Race fan? That's okay. What are you guys doing with your lives? <laughs> so everybody has homework. Supergirl and Drag Race. Start writing it down. Because the next time we're here, we're going to check. We're not. We're going to check. We're not going to check. Um, so for those of you who don't watch it, there's something really magical about this idea of, um, of performing gender, right? And performing it in a way that's personal to who you are and that can unlock something differently about somebody who doesn't maybe identify as that gender. Uh, which I think is something that beautifully comes through in a lot of your work, not, not that literally, um, but this idea of, of having a certain freedom, I think that's very present in this one summer, um, and dropping some self-consciousness or embracing that time in your life where, where you can really decide, this is what I like, this is what I want to do, um, and there's so much joy in that. Did you feel when you were writing it that this story was ever going to be that challenged or that anybody was going to interpret it as something that could be potentially dangerous or a bad influence? I had no idea. I mean, I was really so focused on capturing this thing of like the summer at the cottage. Like first of all, so the inspirations of the book are very like, uh, like Alice Munro and Disney the Fox and the Hound. That is like the two main, that is the two main things that come together for me in this one summer. Uh, like this idea of the real complexity, you know, of the Canadian literature and like the sort of, like the kind of complex landscape and complex cast of characters. And then just this idea of like two girls, who, one of whom is younger than the other. And when one person grows up a little faster and what that sort of experience is like. And so I was so focused on getting that right. And then when we first handed it in to our publisher, our publisher was like, oh, it's a, okay. <laughs> like. This isn't what we thought it was going to be. It never occurred to me that we were like, I think the thing is, is they were like, well, this is a YA book because it's about kids, but it's also a book about adults. But I was like, you can't really write, a kids without, write about kids without writing about adults because that's what kids are obsessed with at one age. Like, Wendy wants to be a kid and Rose wants to be an adult. So that part of that world is all that she's thinking about. And I really wanted to kind of get into that contrast to those things. So I can understand why people would say, and you know, to be clear, the book is really not for kids like, I think the book says 
15 and up or 12 and up. And I would say that I've talked to 12 year olds who read it, but they're very mature 12 year olds. <laughs> They're like stunningly mature. Like I had a 12 year old tell me that he was really glad that the book discussed miscarriage, which I was like, where are you from? <laughs> it's insane that you exist. Um, but I think that it, it is a book that is about adults from a kid's perspective. And so it's maybe not for every kid. But I also think that, you know, like there were lots of books that I read when I was, I was definitely a kid who was reading up you know, I didn't read like YA. I read like, you know, Timothy Finley and stuff like that. <laughs> I was a very morose kid. So that's how I, you know, so the book is there for a kid who wants to read something that's maybe not necessarily something that fits their life experience or fits what they're really able to grasp at that age, but you know, that's all right. And you're also writing um, another really great adaptation that's, is it? Is it an adaptation? What? Well, not adi I said the wrong word. Um, continuation is what I meant to say. Yeah. Of Lumberjanes. I am. I am writing a middle grade prose book series for Abrams Books of the Lumberjanes series, which I am like fanatically obsessed with. Like, I love the Lumberjanes. So it was really weird to get a call. And they were like, my agent was like, do you know like the Lumberjanes? I was like, yes, I do. Why? <laughs> I was like, talk to you later. she was like, yeah, exactly. I was like, I'm not leaving my hotel room until you tell me what this is about. I was so excited. And I love Boom Studios. I love everything about that whole like group of people. Uh, and I love that it's a series of books that's about like teamwork and all of those sort of like, it's like a buddy thing yeah. about girls instead of being about them being vicious to each other. And I just, love everything about it. And actually, I just finished the first book, uh, which is coming out, I think, in October. I don't know. I don't actually know when it's coming out. Pretend I didn't say that. Uh, it's coming out this year. Um, yeah, and it was really fun. It was really cool to just like get into the heads of characters that you really like. Because it's funny, because I've been writing like Hulk and Supergirl, and so to go from that to go from writing Hulk to writing Lumberjanes was like, just like dancing in the flowers. I was like, this is fun. I just ate ice cream and like <laughs> watched stupid TV and wrote the Lumberjanes and it was great. Was it fun having more page room with them than a typical graphic novel has? You, you get to describe it. It's not the exact same collaborative storytelling where you're doing the pictures and the words. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing about writing comics is you're always writing to 20 pages. So like 20 pages is something I'm intimately aware of, aware of all the time now. Like someone will pitch, someone will talk to me about a comic book story and I'll say like, that doesn't sound like 20 pages because that's the way that I think. Um, and pacing is so crucial to 20 pages that it's become like an obsession. So it's kind of fun to just have like a chapter. And I was like writing like, I was like, I'm gonna make this chapter super short because I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's just over now. This is the end of this chapter. What are you gonna do about it? Like I was really, I was enjoying that part of it. And yeah, prose is fun. Like prose is just like, because prose is so much about the voice. And I think, you know, with captions in a comic book, you're so trying to like not take up space on a page and let the, let the pictures really do their job. And to just be like, it's only me, I'm in charge. Just really just like. Instead of how do I distill this to the fewest words possible right. to convey who this character is? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, being able to have like a weekend where you eat anything you want to versus someone saying you can have one thing, one thing that you really want. So then you have to really think about what that one thing will be because you don't want to blow it on like popcorn. What questions do you guys have? Does anyone have any questions? No, no questions. Go ahead. Um, so you write the comics and you write not comics, right? The prose. Yes. Um, do you ever have an idea, like when you start with an idea for something, do you always know like which format it's gonna be in? And follow-up question, have you ever been wrong? Um, I, th I think I know, I mean I tend to know per project. Like I, um, I, I knew that Saving Montgomery Soul, which was the last novel that I wrote, I knew I wanted it to be a novel because there's a kind of like internal world thing that I think, um, although Skim is a very internal book, but I don't know, it's weird, like you just sort of know. 
like Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me. I was just like, I want to write like a really like John Hughesy lesbian romance comic, and I just pictured it as a comic. Um, there's definitely some things that I'll think of as projects, and I'll be like, oh, that'll take so long to write. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. Maybe we could do it as a comic, and then it won't take so long. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing with comics is most of the comic book work I do now is kind of presented to me as like, do you want to do this thing? So the last three series I've done have just been sort of like offered to me. And um, yeah, then it's kind of funny because then you're like, is this a Hulk story? I think it's a Hulk story. Like really actually what it is is I have various obsessions in my life and I try to think where they'll fit into the story, like where I can kind of put them. So what project am I working on now? Like, for example, I'm obsessed with baking videos, like obsessed with baking videos. And I was like, where can I put that? Like, I don't really, it doesn't fit into the story I'm writing right now. And then I was like, I'll put it in the Hulk. I'll put it in the Hulk. So the Hulk is obsessed with baking videos because I am obsessed with them. Um, and I have I ever been wrong? I don't think, I think the thing is, is that every project I've ever done, especially as a comic, changes by the time it gets to the illustrator, because you sort of have an idea of what a book will be, and you write this outline, which is like a promise, this entirely empty promise that you give to a publisher, like, here's the book I'm going to write for you. And then you're like, eight months later, like, that is not the book that I have written for you. <laughs> um, and then it sort of just becomes the project it will be. Like, this one summer was originally a very fantastical book when we pitched it. And there was a lot of kind of fantastical elements. And then when I started writing it, I was like, I am not that writer. I cannot write like dragons, so I'm not gonna do that. And then once the book goes to someone like Jillian, like her take on the story totally molds what the story will eventually be. Um, so yeah, like it's weird, to, it sounds kind of irresponsible to say I'm surprised by a lot of things when they're finished, but it is surprising. Like I just have been looking at the illustrations for Laura Dean and it's so much more, because Rosemary is such a lush illustrator, it's totally this thing that I didn't expect, which is kind of great. Yes. Is your revision process different for comics versus prose? Yeah, prose is really, um, well, because with prose, the revision is totally you. Like, the only person who can fix what's going to be fixed is the writer. So. Like, the revision process takes a really, really long time. Uh, also because, it, like, you know, with text, it's so dense, right? Like, moving around chapters and everything that gets moved affects everything else. Um, and so my editing process takes, like, it can take a year to edit a book properly. And I'm really lucky because I have really great editors. Um, with comics, it totally depends. Um, it's usually, it's kind of more like, like shifts. Like actually, this one summer was edited quite a bit between Jillian and myself as we sort of went through the script and saw what needed to be added and taken away. Um, but the, the, like my part of it is like text, so it's not the sort of heavy lifting of it. Um, and then with comics, with like series, like writing Hulk or something like that, a lot of the editing takes place in the lettering phase where you have everything is done and then you're just changing the captions around because it's weird how stupid captions can look when you finally see them on the page and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm not a good writer. <laughs> I have to change all of this stuff. Um, also because the, pros, the turnaround for comics is so fast. It's like a month between when you start and when it eventually comes out. So it's much quicker. Uh, and you tend to do, you kind of need to do edits in the lettering phase because you really need to make sure whatever you make fits with the illustrations. Um, that's kind of like the main, my main goal in editing comics. So, yes. Also, and something that I think is really interesting and bizarre between prose and comics is there's generally one way to edit a prose novel. And in comics, there are a million ways to write a script, True. to deliver a script, to look back on a script. There are writers who don't even write dialogue until they get finished pages to right. see exactly what the artist has done. Um, there's an amazing comics writer named Brian K. Vaughan who I think at this point 10 years ago I heard him say this one thing that has never left me which was when he's writing a script the only thing the only way that he looks at it is like he's writing a love letter to his artist yeah that the only person he thinks about telling the story to is the person drawing it 
so that when he gets pages back, it's more that he's, he's more inspired to tell a better story based on whatever idea he gave them. Well, because you have to, it is the thing that's taking up the space on the pages, the illustrations, and you really have to do those justice. Like, I think that a lot of the times, it's not like the, especially with captions, because I think that there's a right onness that can be like a overly directness that you can do with captions when you're in the lettering or when you're in the scripting phase where you're writing a story. But captions aren't supposed to be a story. They're supposed to be, they're this thing that contrasts with and works with the image on the page. And I think it's almost like this thing where I'm most inspired to write captions once I've seen, like I feel like the voice, like when you're, when you don't see, especially because a lot of captions, you're not seeing the character, you're just seeing whatever's on the page. So I really love doing my edits there. Especially with, um, yeah. Well, there's acting, too, in comics. Like, you could see an artist bring back a facial expression, and you don't even need the dialogue anymore. Yeah. Because they just nailed it on that one panel. And well, readers and then, are smart, and they get exactly what's being said. And then what I want, typically want to do is have it be that the captions contrast whatever's on the page and give information that you wouldn't get. Like, yeah, I am sad is like the most. I am sad is only appropriate if you're seeing a character on, on the page not looking sad. Because otherwise, it's right there. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I take a lot of inspiration from people like Brian and also um, like a lot of Canadian comic book writers like Seth who do really interesting things with the way that they write comics and the way that their writing works with the pictures that are really like... I mean, with Skim, it kind of happened by like not... It, did, it didn't happen on my watch because I wrote Skim as a diary and then Jillian like did a lot of these contrasting things with the images. And I think we sort of each had a lot of room to kind of do whatever we thought we needed to do for the story. Um, and so I do think of it as, I think of it as writing to the illustrator, but I also think of it as like, I'm gonna do my thing and then you can go and do your thing. And I try to never get in the way of someone else doing their thing. Good question. Yeah, that was good. Obviously we had a lot to say about it, yes? Are there any books from your teenage years that inspired you that you can recall? And also, what are you reading now that's inspiring you? Um, the biggest influence on my writing life was uh, Louise Fitzhugh's Harriet's, Harriet the Spy. This is, to me, the most important child book ever written, ever. Um, I'm also a huge fan of The Outsiders. Uh, and that was like a big book for me. And then, yeah, like most of my childhood writing or reading was Alice Munro. Like when I was a kid, I was a super nerd. Um, so this is the nerd I was when I was a kid. I vowed that I would read only Canadian literature for my whole high school life. And I like literally spoke those words, <laughs> probably while looking at the moon in my bedroom, like I vowed it. Um, so I read all of Timothy Finley, all of Margaret Lawrence, all of Alice Munro, um, all of Margaret Atwood, and that was like that's absolutely where my work comes from. I don't know if they would appreciate me saying that, but it's true. Um, currently, I'm reading. I mostly read nonfiction because I try not to be too influenced by other um, other writing, especially when I'm writing YA, which is what I'm doing right now. So I have like a pile of really great books that I haven't read yet um, because I'm trying to finish my novel first. Um, I did read Susan Faludi's book. I think it's called The Dark Room, which is a really incredible book, um, really interesting book. Um, and I read How to Survive a Plague uh, by David France, which is also really amazing. So I read really light. <laughs> Really light nonfiction. Um, and then I do read a lot of comics. Um, I just finished uh, Southern Bastards, which is just an amazing series. And actually, if I have one recommend, and you're going to think that, you're going to think, no, Mariko, but yes, uh, the new Flintstone series out That's of DC so Comics is so good, is so smart. And I can't remember the name of the writer. I can't remember either, but it was a dark horse. It was a, it came out of nowhere. It is just unbelievable. And you're gonna think, I didn't like the Flintstones. It doesn't matter. 
It's like, very political. It's about it's about gay marriage. It's about consumerism. It's about PTSD. It's about like yeah, war. It's about all of these <laughs> things that you're like, how is this the Flintstones? <sighs> Um, but it really just blew me away and I kind of like charged through the whole thing and so that is a book that I've been recommending to everybody and nobody believes me but many people have since texted and emailed me and thanked me for recommending that series so it made a big splash when it came out people were very surprised of like Fred Flintstone? Also, Fred Flintstone is kind of hot in this book. It's weird. He's kind of beefy. Yeah, he's like this kind of like beefy, ruggedly handsome man. Um, I was like actually tying one of my my gay friends and he was like, I'm going to read this book. And I was like, yes, you are. Um, It's really, really good. So that's what's been really inspiring me. Actually, like, it's really amazing. Like, I think... Like, I like so many different genres, and I love the way that they appear in comics. Like, Southern Bastards is really this dark, vaguely horror-ish book about the South. And football. Yeah, and football, which I also like in fiction. Um, so, yeah, that's been my, those have been my, my big... Also not a kid's book. Not Just a kid's book. There. Really not a kid's book. Um, but The Flintstones is. The Flintstones, totally, anybody can read it. Will you guys go read the Flintstones now? That'd be good. Yes. Are you guys both writers? And what was your first debut publishing piece? Uh, the first thing I ever wrote that was published, um, well, the first thing I ever wrote that was published was when I was in university. Uh, I had a bunch of friends who started a literary magazine. And surprise, surprise, they published me in it, (laughs) Um, which is one way to get published, is to help your friends establish a literary magazine. Um, And then I didn't get published again until I, when I was in, when I finished college, I moved back to Toronto and I took a woman's writing class with a bunch of um, fabulous women. And the woman who taught the class was also a publisher and she published an anthology of people in the class and then she published my first novel um, which is mostly stacked up in my mom's basement, so I don't know if you'll be able to find it. Um, but yeah, that was when I was uh, 22, I think, 20. Um, I'm also a writer. I was a journal. I did comics journalism for a long time, so I mean, if the internet is just littered with years and years of comics writing that I've done. Um, my first published comics work comes out this year in an anthology called Femme Magnifique, uh, which is celebrating women uh, in different professions throughout history and telling their stories. I wrote a story about Mary Blair, the Disney animator. Um, and editorially, I've edited comics that have come out, but most of my writing has been prose, journalism, and um, you know, stuff for just different websites. Uh, I also wrote part of She Changed Comics, which is a comic book legal defense fund book who defended Mariko. Well, not legally, but... um, Morally. Comic comic book legal defense fund is a nonprofit that supports artists, writers, and creators whose books have been challenged, um, both at local levels and if it becomes a legal challenge. And they put out a book. Oh, my God. I don't remember when it came out. Uh, within the last year called She Changed Comics about the history of women in comics. It's really good, not just because I'm in it. Yeah, Femme Magnifique is going to be really amazing. I know somebody who's doing a, something about Louise Fitou. Mm. Mm-hmm. And uh, like just about every amazing woman you can think of as having a story written about them in the anthology, which is being edited by Shelley Bond. Um, and there's a Kickstarter, I think there's a web page for it. And it's really, it's going to be really great. Kieran Gillen is writing about Bjork. Yeah, it's going to be super <laughs> cool. It's going to be amazing. I know, I'm a little intimidated. I'm like, um, everybody just go for Kieran and no, Gerard it's Way. Good. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting project. There you go. Go out there and get published. It's not, you know, it just takes time, that's all, getting published. Well, what you said about your friend starting a literary magazine is honestly pretty true about comics, that I think one of the most critical things, especially in looking at the people that you've worked with is the comic book industry and the best comics are because of amazing relationships between the creators. Um, Jason and Jason on Southern Bastards is completely based on their common 
history in the South and like all the context that they have for it. Um, when you started doing licensed work, did you have any kind of um, any kind of changes to your approach from working with people that you knew really intimately or that you had a different relationship with versus people that you were a little bit more paired up with editorially? I was really freaked out to work with people that I didn't know, that I wasn't related to. Um, so actually when I first started doing... Just in general? Just in general. <laughs> I was like, who are you? My aunt doesn't know you? That's weird. We're all related in Canada. Oh, well, exactly. Um, so actually I... Um, generally try to have a Skype with people when I first start working for them. Like the first thing is like, it's kind of like this arranged marriage. Like somebody <laughs> gives you like their work and they're like, what do you think? Do you like this work? This is this person's work. They look very nice. Doesn't he look handsome, right? Um, yeah, well, or however it is, it works. Um, so I, I tend to, you know, or I guess it's not, an, it's like a business partnership basically. And I try to be like, really to like the person's art as much as possible. So when I have it say, I go for like that. And then, which I always have. I've just been really lucky. And then I- Was Phil your first, was Tomb Raider the first one? Tomb Raider was, no. Tomb Raider wasn't my first one. I did a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, that's right, with? With Irene Coe, mm -hmm. who's also amazing. Uh, and then, so when I first started doing Tomb Raider, I basically like forced Philip Sevy to Skype with me. Cause I was like, I need to see your face. <laughs> um, I kind of force this like intimacy on him basically. Um, because you're really in it together. Like you are going to work. Also, like you're going to ask this person to do this really hard job. Like you're gonna ask them to draw things that are really hard to draw and like, you know, draw like fight scenes and murders and all this stuff. And I wanted to like trust him. So and really over the space of like 12 issues, you know, we basically worked together for like a year and a half. And you actually, I think the work got better the more we knew each other and the more I knew I could just say like, Laura fights these guys. <laughs> and that would be like the holy thing. For like a whole page, it would just say, Laura fights men. Um, <laughs> so uh, Laura fights men. Uh, so yeah. And then I think uh, since then I've just been really lucky that I've, like now also, like one of the reasons that it's good to socialize in the, in the world that you work in is so that when you do get paired up with somebody, it's likely that you yeah. know them. Um, so I've had that, like, although it's funny because Nico Leon, who I work with, um, who I believe lives in Brazil, uh, it just so happens that we have the exact same sense of humor, which is a really warped sense of humor. So he and I just happen to, like, have that in common, and that's why there's, like, you find the thing that you connect with the person the most, and then you make sure that that is something that you, you, you know, maximize on. So we both have this weird sense of humor, and so the whole comic is littered with Easter eggs <laughs> of things that we think are really funny um, that you really have to like look in the backgrounds to find. Any other questions? I thought I saw a hand start to go up. No. Yes. Kind of similar to what you were just speaking about. Is there someone you have not worked with yet that you maybe would like to say? Oh, geez. Um. Who would I like to work with? I have a really long time fan of Jeff Lemire. I've always been a huge fan of his work. Um, and I love the kinds of stories that he tells. Like um, the Essex County Trilogy is one of my favorite comics. And I would love to work with him um, on something. That would be really great. Um, who else? So whoever I'm not gonna say, I'm gonna sound like a total jerk. Um, I mean, I really like the chance to work with different people. Like, it's been really great working with Rosemary, who's like, you know, a newer person to comics. And that's been, I mean, a newer person who was also like an incredibly accomplished person. And she's like, anyway, she's younger than I am. And she's incredibly accomplished. <laughs> it's really intimidating. Um, who else? I mean, I, I'm such a big fan of so many people, like Annie Wu, I'm a huge fan of. And I look at her. Yeah, her stuff is super great. Yeah. And I mean, even editors and stuff like that, like I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of really great editors, bless you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because I think sometimes I'll think that I just really like someone's work and then I'll think, is that a reason to want to like work with them? Like, I really like Southern Bastards, but I don't think either of those guys, I don't think they're like, I want to work with Mariko Tamaki. It's I think hard, just, right? 
you have to have the right artist for the right story. Yeah, you do. And you can't like, like I've also been offered, like I'm a huge fan of many different comics and I've, you know, been offered some things and I'm like, I'm a huge fan of this character. I am not the person to write this book. Um, and I think that I'm slowly learning that over time. Like, I think that you have to have like a real desire to do something at this point. And so that's what I'm doing now. Like, um, I really, like I really loved writing the Adventure Time series because I was like, I just love this show. And I have this really weird idea and they were totally into it. I was like, I want to do a best princess ever competition. And they were like, do it. So I was like, you okay. You were re-watching a lot of Project Runway. I was watching so much Project Runway. Although actually it's m more modeled off of America's Next Top Model. Um, except that they're not as mean to each other. Uh, so yeah. I mean, I think it's also like, sometimes I think you take a project too because you think, oh, I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily think that I'm the best suited for this, but I really want, like I would really love to do something nonfiction in comics, and so I think it's not necessarily something I've ever done before, but I think it would be a really great learning experience, so. Like what kind of nonfiction? Like I really loved, um, I loved March, and I thought like, that is a great way, or like what you guys are doing with Femme Magnifique, like, to get into something very serious um, and complicated in a comic book form. I just read um, California Dreamin', which is the, um, what's the name of the Mamas and the Papas person? Ma uh, Cass. Mama Cass biography, and it is amazing. It's incredible. And the illustrations are so good. Uh, and I was like, this is great, because it's an incredible biography of a really amazing, interesting person. And I think that it's, you know, it's amazing to have it. I think that that's sort of the place where I feel like comics can really go is into this nonfiction place. So I'm kind of curious and to try that. And they seem so separate yeah. from other comics. Like you just, there are tons of, of nonfiction and biographical and autobiographical comics out there that just don't seem to make the rounds in the same way. Well, it's funny because comic book people are the biggest nerds in the world. Like, nobody has more specific obsessions than a comic book person. Case in point, Chester Brown wrote a Louis Riel comic, which is a book about this Canadian figure in Canadian history. You know, and Kate Beaton writes all these books about, you know, these little comics about, like, the boy and nasty boy, the Janet Jackson song, but also, like, the Bronte sisters and all and this other, and suffragettes and... <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, why not maximize in the thing we do really well, which is obsess about tiny things that nobody else really cares about. I just recently reread My Friend Dahmer because I've been on a big true crime kick because I also write YA and I can't read YA while I write it. I right. have to read horrible, grisly, terrible things. I know you read horrible, grisly. for teenagers. <laughs> you read horrible, grisly, terrible things. <laughs> <I have to. laughs> um, but even stuff like that, that, that is such an... I can't imagine the pitching process for something like that, where it's like, let me tell you about how I grew up with Jeffrey Dahmer, and let me illustrate it for you. Right. But Why not? A good comic is a good comic. I think, you know, like I think that there's many comics that have come out that you're like, it's about what? March. Yeah, exactly. Civil rights like, movement as a comic. Right. No, but and I think it's that... it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Like, I think that that's kind of... And it, there is something about comics that is, I think, inviting to a wide swath of readers. Um, and there, it's also, you know, it's not like you're missing out on any literariness because March is a beautiful book. Not just because it's an illustrated book, but because the writing is also yeah. beautiful. So, you know. I um, This is kind of on topic, but off topic. I recently found when you work in comics, you tend to have thousands of comics in your house all the time. And sometimes you have to move because you have so many books. Um, I found this comic, I was sent at one point, like an arc, that's trench poetry from World War I and World War II that people fighting in the trenches wrote as they were dying, and somebody said, you know what we should do with this? We should make a comic. We should make a comic. Oh my gosh. And I just read it and cried. Like, the impact of it was so different. A subject I don't really care about. Right. But I think that visual storytelling has a way of emotionally impacting you in a way that just seeing the words on the page can't. Well, and also, like, one of the great things that so many comics have done is, is, is a medium for people telling very personal stories, like Diary of a Teenage Girl, oh, yeah. right, where you can really get into, you know, 
get into really deep stuff about you know your own life. And a lot of like whenever I go to high schools or colleges or art schools and people give me their first comics, they're typically about like really personal things. And there's something about the sort of like metaphorical, symbolic things that you can do with illustration that makes them a really great vehicle for that as well. And then you look at people like Raina Telgemeier, right? who up until her last book, all of her comics were slice of life, things that had happened to her, at Babysitter's Club. Um, one thing I do see that happens that's interesting is that it seems like women get put into that niche a lot more. That they expect comics that are biographical, they expect these really personal stories, they expect that, especially women cartoonists, that that's where they're gonna go because there are so many amazing ones out there. Um, have you felt any sense of that you're a little bit more compelled to tell personal stories or to infuse your stories with that? I'm just a very personal person. <laughs> I think that there was, um, the first book that I wrote was incredibly personal um, because like I said, I think that there is this kind of like book that everybody has inside of them that's like straight from the heart. It's like a story like, like when you're a teenager and you're in creative writing class and then you go to high, you know, university and you're writing like stories that you're submitting to magazines, it's usually a very personal story that like starts you off. Like, almost uncomfortably personal. And I feel like as you grow as a writer, you figure out a way to tell that story in a way that is literary instead of just intensely personal. Like that's the real like struggle is to find a way to be like confessional without just like Making being that person you. on your, like on the phone with your friends and they're like, uh-huh, right. Oh, that sounds horrible. Yeah. Like, you know, you're trying to Do go you to see these pictures of my minor surgery? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I still have a scar. So it's hard to get beyond that point, but I feel like that is, and it's like the grand tradition of women. Women have this history of being, you know, like the confessors and the people who are mired in like the personal stuff and men are more interested in like trucks and being heroes, I guess, hypothetically. Oh, I think yeah. that's changing it. Yeah. I mean, I think like I look at Nate Powell's early books and they're obviously like telling very personal stories and yeah. I think the one thing is that I found that when I did eventually move into more fictional stuff and move more away from my own personal experience, people assume about stuff written by women that it's very personal and autobiographical to the extent that Skin, which is this comic, one of my first comics I did with my cousin, which is about a girl in a private school who falls in love with her English teacher. <laughs> and when I went to my old high school, I was accosted by many teachers who were like, who is this book about? And I was like, it's fiction. It's fiction. First of all, if it wasn't fiction, it would be like a lawsuit. Right. So obviously it's fiction. But there was this thing, and I think that you know, many people, when you get interviewed about your books, want to know like, where it connects with your own personal life, which first of all, like none your business, and second of all, like why not have like some faith in a writer's ability to take whatever personal inspiration they have and turn it into fiction, or to maybe just make stuff up. I make stuff up all the time. <laughs> I make stuff up for a living. I know. In fact, it's funny because sometimes I will, though, like be thinking about something and I'll be like, did that happen to me or did I write that? <laughs> and I'm assuming that happened to me. I had like a serious, and the thing is I can't call my parents because they never know. Like my dad always says like that didn't happen and my mom will pretty much guess that it did. So I'm completely stuck. But I was like, I remember this thing, but I think it's in a book. Well, I can't remember what book. <laughs> so, yeah. Dementia. <laughs> um, speaking of personal stuff, I, I don't. I have no idea how I came across it. I found an anthology of kids horror that you or like teenage horror that you wrote. Oh for. yeah, half minute horrors. Was that really based on your dad? Yes. Okay, you so, should tell people about this story. I had no idea you were in the book, and I read it, and I was like, this is real. So Susan Rich is the editor of Lemony uh, Lemony Snicket, and she did this book that was like a for the benefit of something. It was like raising money for something. And she asked all these writer friends of hers to write 30 minute horror, 30 second horror stories. And so when I was a kid, when we would go to the cottage, every year my dad would dig us a hole in the sand, like a five foot deep hole, like a borderline dangerous for little kids to play in a hole. Just a grave. Yeah, like basically a tiny grave. <laughs> and he would say to us, when he was leaving, he would be like, well, you know, be careful because there's a monster in the hole. Anyway, see you later. And he would just walk away. And what he would tell us is, is that at night, that's when the monster was just like a way to get us inside, basically. <laughs> he would say that there was a monster that would be in the hole. 
And my friend, I would always be like, my dad is lying. And my friend would always be like, what if your dad is telling the truth? <laughs> so uh, yes, so basically I wrote this story about a hole that has a monster in it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think I told my dad and he was like, whatever. <laughs> I was about to ask, like, has, he, has he admitted? Uh, no, yeah, I totally made up a monster and dug a hole every summer just to mess with you. Well, my dad is kind of like, I mean, I've, like I talk about my dad a lot because my dad was a very, um, loosely connected to the truth. Like he would say things all the time that you would be like, that's not true. But he would say it like with such like, like when we were listening to the Beach Boys, he would be like, I used to sing with the Beach Boys. Like so convicted. Yeah, just like very deadpan, yeah. always with the same like delivery. And you would be like, but that's not true, that can't be true. But then when I was a kid, I sort of felt like maybe it is true. So I had like huge amounts of my life where my dad saying things like we used to have so actually one of the inspirations of this one summer is we used to drive by, when we used to drive the cottage there was a turkey hatchery on the way to the cottage and every time we drove by it my dad would say that's where your brother was born your brother was born there and you know of course my brother would be like that's not true i was not born there and so on that beach boys tour with yeah exactly and, he, and, he and that's where he was born so like every summer for like my brother's whole life basically <laughs> and then eventually they tore down the turkey hatchery and they put a ps storage up there and my dad my brother was probably like oh no more of the joke and my dad be like that used to be a turkey hatchery. <laughs> That's where your brother was born. So that actually is the one of the sort of stories in the book is about this turkey jerky that comes, that they think makes people pregnant. And that came from the story my dad told. So not exactly the story, but like a version of it. But I have used that, I have used things that my dad has said over the years. They appear. Uh, in various things. And I always tell them, like, ha ha, I put you in a book. <laughs> do your parents read your comics? Uh, yeah, they do. I mean, they haven't read, they haven't read any of the superhero stuff yet, I don't think. Uh, they read Supergirl. But, um, Which has a great dad in it. It does have a great dad. Such it has a like a, dad. it has a very, like, Pixar-y, some, somewhere between Every dad in every Pixar movie and John Goodman from Roseanne. That's totally, that's exactly, basically, with conspiracy theories. Yeah, exactly. Well, I love conspiracy theorists. What's and your favorite one right now, your favorite theory? I don't have any favorite theory. I mean, I'm just like, uh, I was watching, like, I appreciate the person who is like, so defiantly refusing to be like a part of any system but not recognizing that by refusing to be a part of the system, you kind of still are a part of the system. Um, so I also, like, part of the dad's thing is where he, like, doesn't believe in birthdays. Kind of as, like, a version of my dad being, like, saying whatever he would say. Like, my dad would always tell me, like, when's your birthday? Like, he always pretends like he doesn't know when my birthday is. So it's, like, a version of that. They probably didn't keep good records at the turkey hatchery. No, exactly. I wasn't born in the turkey hatchery. My oh. brother was born in the turkey but hatchery. Still, I mean, you get I was into the habit. The, I was born in the hospital. That's true. As far as you know. Are we good for time? Should we do one more question if anyone has another question? Yeah, does anyone have one last question? No? Thank All right. you guys so much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>